Who here remembers that sound? <laughs> Not because you watched it in the movies, but you actually remember sitting there and waiting, right? Okay. Now, cast your mind back to the last time you heard that sound. Depending on where you lived and when you got broadband, that may be 15, 20, 25 years. Cast your mind back, close your eyes if you want, and just think about how your personal life has changed since then. How did you come here this morning? How many of you still put a paper ticket through the gates or an Oyster card? How many of you use the watch or phone? How do you listen to music? Where do you listen to music? When did you last buy a record? How do you watch movies? How do you weigh yourself? Do you still have legacy kettles and refrigerators and toasters? The reality is our life in the last 15, 20, 25 years has absolutely and completely been changed. We have all digitalized. I haven't had a landline in eight years. I got rid of my satellite and TV box about four years ago. Everything I watch is now over the internet. We have watches and scales, rings. They're all digitally connected. As a matter of fact, 90% of the world's data, 90, 90% of the world's data has been generated in the last two years by all these connected devices we own. My daughter is 21, refuses to get a driver's license. So do most of her friends. As a matter of fact, driver license applications for young people between the ages of 18 and 25 are at a record low ever. So there's no question we've digitalized our personal lives. What about business? And by the way, I, I, unfortunately, I missed the millennial and Generation Z panel this morning. But just think about these digitalized generations coming into the workforce today. And for them, whether they're on Teams or Zooms or Google Meets makes a difference. They have expectations of what digitalized businesses should look like. And for those businesses that haven't digitalized yet, here's my favorite quote. I wish I could say it's mine, it isn't. But I do use it a lot. What are the seven most expensive words in business? We have always done it this way. The inertia of not wanting to change, the inertia of not wanting to digitalize, leaving the door open to someone else doing it on your behalf is the most expensive mistake we can do in business. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex, and I'm the managing director for Zero. Zero is a cloud software provider, and we provide accounting and bookkeeping, payroll and payment services over the cloud. And I stand here representing over one million small businesses in the UK. Now, when I say small business, let me talk about one of my pet peeves. We hear a lot about small businesses, micro businesses, micro enterprises, SMEs. I don't need to tell you, those are not synonymous. They are not the same. A sole trader or a business with fewer than 10 employees has absolutely nothing to do with a company that has 100 plus, 200 plus, 250 employees. And we're all guilty of amalgamating them. We're all guilty of confusing them or using the term loosely, small businesses, SMEs, assuming everything's included. I was at a government conference the other day and a small business was on stage and was being highlighted. They had 400 employees and over 150 million pounds in revenue. I wish all small businesses were like that. Um, so it's complete, it's complete nonsense. And that really is what we call the SME fallacy. So let me spend a little bit of time and talk about small businesses with fewer than 10 employees. 
Hands up. Anyone here owns or runs a business with fewer than 10 employees or is a sole trader? Great. Anyone here is no longer a small business with fewer than 10 employees but remembers when you were there? Okay. Um, now, I don't need to tell you when you're a small business with fewer than 10 employees, you probably don't have an HR director and a finance manager and a communications director and someone who does social media and a procurement manager. Those are all your jobs. You do every single one of them yourself. Now, small businesses with fewer than 10 employees create one in four jobs and contribute 935 billion pounds to the economy. There are 5.3 million businesses in the UK that are either sole traders or have fewer than 10 employees. That's 95% of all companies in the UK. It's a massively, massively important sector and one we need to pay attention to because you pack a mighty punch. So we need to move away from this one-size-fits-all approach and move away from this, well, small businesses and focus on the specific barriers of what is holding back the smallest of businesses. And this is where digitalization comes in. There's something we call beating the digital drag. And what we mean by that is when you look at those smaller businesses with fewer than 10 employees and you compare them to the larger small businesses, anywhere between 10 and 250 employees, there's a significant gap. The smaller businesses, fewer than 10, only 30% of them tell us that they have increased their digital tools or have adopted more digital technology since 2019. This comes from a research we ran with CBR Light last year. Only 30%. That's 69% for the larger businesses. Only 41% of the smaller businesses say that they have played around or experimented with AI. That's 77% for the larger small businesses. And even worse, 40% of small businesses say that they fail to see the relevance of adopting more technology. But if they did, if we were to catch up the businesses with fewer than 10 employees to the same level of digitalization as the top 20%, we would see a 77 billion boost to our economy, not to mention a significant increase to employment. And it's incumbent upon us, the software industry, businesses at large, policymakers, government, to start talking up the benefits of digitalization and the benefits of how that becomes relatable to not only growing and surviving, but thriving. I still hear too many organizations and too many think tanks or trade bodies seeing digitaliz digitalization as a distraction to small businesses or as additional workload. And don't get me wrong, digitalization, yes, there's an effort involved, absolutely. But here's what it does when you get it right. 38% of the businesses we surveyed as part of this digital drag study tell us that the adoption of digital tools have helped them to improve the experience they offer to the customers. 29% say it actually helped them stay in business. 38% it helped them run their business more smoothly. 31% helped them boost productivity. 32% reduced costs and better efficiency. I have many more statistics and we can make this study available to you. But the reality is digitalization, while maybe sometimes difficult, reaps tangible benefits and helps businesses accelerate their growth, save on costs and improve their efficiency. Now the good news is 40% of small businesses do say that they expect to use more digital tools in the future. 74% of businesses say that they will do more online, whether that's shoring up their web pages or going into e-commerce or doing more advertising on social media. 51% of them 
intend to use more cloud capabilities. And 47% of, of them say they will adopt more accounting and payroll software. 48% are very curious about wanting to use AI. Now, we all know an election is coming up. We can get into debate whether it's May or July or October. It doesn't matter. It will happen this year. So I thought it's a good time to just talk about some of the things that we should ask our government, regardless of who is in government, of what the government can do to help to drive the digitalization journey. First of all, we really need a cross-government, small business digital task force. There are too many individual branches of government looking at digitalization across a specific segment. There is no cross-government collaboration on a digital task force to fundamentally look at what the small businesses, fewer than 10 employees, need to digitalize. Obviously, we need to look at tax treatments and funding and make sure that there are incentives for small businesses to be able to digitalize and to deduce that from tax liabilities in the future. It's really important that we make advice more accessible and more scalable for small businesses. Yes, I know the government launched Help to Grow. I saw Help to Grow out there. But Help to Grow is not available to businesses with fewer than five employees. Now, luckily, other trade bodies are jumping in and covering that vacuum. We work closely with Small Business Britain, who has a program called Small and Mighty. And Small and Mighty now has over 1,800 small businesses that have gone through three separate cohorts of small business mentorship and education. But it's critical that the government continues helping to make advice more accessible and more scalable. And that includes accountants and bookkeepers, who are the secret weapon of our economy. The secret weapon of our economy. We would not have gone through COVID if you hadn't had accountants and bookkeepers standing by the side of businesses to help you navigate the complexity of COVID or the complexity of the tax code or the complexity of managing your cash flow. We do need to crack regulatory issues and simplify the complex tax systems. We just had a statement last week. I don't know who thinks that increasing the VAT threshold from 85 to 90 really was a noodle, needle mover. But there's significantly more work to be done around cracking regulatory issues and then boosting the skills in the economy, especially the skills around digitalization. Um, and we think the Small Business Commission would be incredibly, incredibly helped if the Small Business Commission was given the resources and assets to do more in that space. Tackle infrastructure. We still see a massive divide between rural and urban areas when it comes to broadband connectivity. And last but not least, just simplifying regulation and the tax code. We're, we're lucky at Zero that we are a global company. We have a presence in various markets. And, and one market that I draw a lot of inspiration from is Singapore. The Singaporean government puts their money where their mouth is. It's a government that is absolutely dedicated to investing in digitalization, investing in infrastructure, investing in simplifying the tax code and make sure that it works for the smallest of businesses. And we see probably one of the most modern digitalized economies in the world. It is an example of what a strong and committed government can do. Now, I want, to, I want to kind of leave you with a couple of practical steps in terms of what we hear and what we see and what we think small businesses can do when it comes to digitalization. And I could give you a long list of 20 different things to do, but I will try and just boil it down to, to three main ones. The first one is learn and adapt. Running your own business is a very, very, very lonely world. You probably spent a better part of a Saturday evening at the kitchen table, doing your accounts, running over your numbers. Maybe you share them with a partner or the family member. Maybe you share them with an accountant or bookkeeper, but it gets very lonely. The fact that you're sitting in this room is just a great indication of the fact that you're reaching out to others 
And I suspect that you will get more value from talking to each other amongst yourselves than necessarily listening to me or any of the other speakers. It's an incredibly lonely world. And I can only encourage you to surround yourself with advice. Now, some of the best advice will typically come from bookkeepers and accountants. We don't talk enough about the value bookkeepers and accountants can give to small businesses. I was, I was talking to an accountant just last week, and he, and he made a very interesting observation, not, not a mind-blowing observation, but just one I hadn't thought of, which is most people, when they're employed by a company, are used to being paid a payroll, it goes into their account, and that is money available to them. The mental shift between suddenly running your own business and the fact that the cash-in isn't your payroll and that you need to put money aside for either VAT or taxes may sound simple, but more often than not, people get it wrong and are then surprised by that. And it's just one example where Surrounding yourself with good advice, bookkeepers and accountants can be an absolute needle mover. The second one is, it's easy for me to stand here and preach and say you should all digitalize. Uh, digitalization is not that easy and I understand that one of the bigger challenges is sometimes choosing what to digitalize, how to digitalize and what to choose. And all I can, all I can recommend is start small but start somewhere. And think of the uh, agile approach of digitalizing the lowest hanging fruit, fruit or the easiest process. Talk to others in terms of what that is and start there and then move from there. Um, where we see the biggest struggle with small businesses is when a small business tries to just do a wholesale transformation around the entire business with various different tools or technologies or systems at the same time. And as a matter of fact, we do know that 27% of businesses tell us that they believe that they got their tech or their software choices. Um, sorry, only 27% think that they got their tech or technology choices right the first time around. And the third one is, think carefully about balancing the costs and the benefits. And I'll give you one example. I, I hear many small businesses um, who worry about cash flow and, and they say, well, the challenge I have is if I use card acceptance or if I use a payment processing service or if I put a pay me now button on an invoice, I will end up paying anywhere between 1.5, 2%, commission on that payment. True. But if that's the opportunity cost of not being paid for 30 days, or if that means you may not see that cash flow over a month, and if that changes your cash flow, that's just one example of, of a cost-benefit analysis I think every business needs to do on their own. Um, look, I, I stand here with the utmost respect for small businesses. I'm not a small business owner. I never have been. I'm an employee in a very large corporation. But I've worked with and I've tried to help and I've been surrounded by small businesses for the past 15 years in my life. I have the utmost respect for what you do every single day. And I just remind ourselves, we are all on a digital journey. Big check on our personal life digital journey. I think we're all, we're all we're off to the races. Some a bit more than others, but we're all off to the races. But think about the digital journey you are on in your businesses and what it will take for you to accelerate that. Because the danger, if you don't, and if you do it the way you have always done it, is that that becomes a very expensive decision. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take some questions and answers. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, let's just shuffle along over here. And as the daughter of an accountant, I'm sure he'll be delighted uh, to hear you say that they're such heroes in the modern world. So a few questions, if I may. So starting with this digital drag, are there particular industries or sectors where we see, see this being more commonplace? We, we separate to the digital drag, we um, regularly run something we call the Zero Small Business Index. Um, we have over a million businesses in the UK, 
on zero. And on a daily basis, we see 2.8 billion pounds flowing through the zero books. We don't process 2.8 billion, but, but that. So we have a <laughs> large quantitative sample of data, which allows us to look into that. And, and we are seeing just over the last three years where certain sectors or certain regions are struggling more than others. It's not necessarily directly linked to digitalization, but it's fair to say when you think of um, the hospitality sector, now a lot of that obviously COVID related, the manufacturing sector um, and the um, construction sector, for example, they have had a much, much tougher time over the last three, four years. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying digitalization is the one solution for them. They obviously have other components affecting that. Um, but it's definitely one of the distinctions I can make. But there's also some sectors that are more heavily reliant on the use of cash, and we can debate whether or not cash is dying, you know, kind of post-COVID. But for example, here, there's a question from a florist, and you can also think the same of kind of hairdressers and uh, other industries where traditionally cash has changed hands. So this, this florist writes, I don't use any technology in my business, I'm a sole trader. What's a simple digital tool I can use in my business as a starter? Yeah. It's a, it's a good question, isn't it? Kind of, yeah. if you haven't taken that first step, how do you do that? Yeah, and I, th I think, uh, you know, what's interesting about some of these questions is, um, I would just start with, what are customers doing? Right? What I suspect is, any florist or anyone that runs a physical shop will just have observed that over the last three or four years, more and more people walk into a shop, just, they just don't have cash on them. So, <laughs> in a, I'm reacting to what the customers are doing mindset, you would need to adapt to that. I think what's interesting about payments in particular is the, the you know, and thank FinTech, but the payment industry has just moved leaps and bounds in the last few years. The, the most recent example of that is you often no longer actually need separate payment devices, right? There's, there's tap on glass technology where your phone, whether it's an Android or an iPhone, becomes a payment device Yes, you need to power the payment processing on it with an app, but you no longer need a separate device. Some of these devices uh, that are being sold out there, yeah, yeah, you can probably find them for 20 pounds, 25 pounds. And so accepting a card payment no longer requires your bank to be involved in that. It no longer requires a 250 or 300 pound maintenance fee on a monthly basis. Technology has made it much more accessible and much cheaper. And again, I think it goes to my practical steps earlier. Talk to others and see what others are doing mm -hmm. and start small. And what about the reasons for this so-called digital drag? You know, um, uh, earlier on you mentioned a few of them, but frankly, you know, speaking to lots of small business owners like I do, like you do every day, particularly at the moment given the cost of living crisis and all of the pressures that small businesses are under, frankly, do they have the time and the headspace for this stuff? I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, and the, the number one reason is probably just time. Time is... <laughs> I think time is our generation's most precious asset, period. And certainly, that gets amplified for small business. Um, I often, you know, Zero, it's interesting, I often want to talk to some of our small businesses and interview them, and they just, they just don't have the time. Um, you know, you can't even get them on the phone because you work 24-7. Um, I think the other one is just, just sheer inertia, right? It's the, we have always done it this way. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a bit of the, the analogy of, you know, if you throw the frog into hot water and the frog jumps out, or if you throw the frog into cold water and slowly start boiling it. The problem is, if your technological need is getting a little bit bigger every single day, right, th there isn't that trigger point, there isn't that inertia point. We all, we all know that COVID was a trigger point. It had to be. Right? People had to reinvent their business model. But, but outside of another pandemic, which, which none of us wants, but um, there needs to be real, I think, introspection by a small business say, look, I, I can continue going like this for a long time, or at some point I just need to make a change. Because if you don't, the next door florist will, or someone around the corner mm -hmm. will, or somebody else will do that for you. So it's that competitive differentiator point. Yeah, absolutely. Loads more to unpack here, but we are at time. So we're now going to ask you to stick around for our panel. Is that we'll okay? Do. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll be back after one short break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.